to the Spent the Rent podcast. I am your host, Patty Rose. My guest returning for the second time today is Mark Molina. Mark, welcome to the show. Thank you. Good to see you. So it's kind of funny I'm having you back on. A, a couple of weeks ago, you were my guest. We talked about your business, leadership, and this is the first time I've done this where the quickest turnaround for a return guest, but a lot has changed in that one week's time or week and a half, 10 days time. Uh, everybody's aware of the fires. You can go outside, see the smoke. But what struck me and made me want to have you back on is we did that episode about leadership and you have shown tremendous leadership in stepping up, doing live feeds, talking about the shelters, the, res the response efforts, uh, the relief efforts to help the evacuees. So I wanted to have you back on, tell us a little bit more about it. Tell us what you've been doing. Tell us what we can do to help, what uh, the community can do to help. So if anybody's unaware, I don't know how, but if you're out of the area and you're listening, uh, you know, they're calling it the Holiday Farms Fire. That's the one that we're covering. Started out in Blue River. And it was, it's pretty much the general consensus that it was started from a broke, a down power line. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. So from a down power line, and then from what I've understood, a monsoon in the center of the country pushed the winds in an opposite direction that is typical. So the winds came west, pushing the fire and smoke in a direction that isn't typical. Obviously, when, when city planning, when cities originate, <laughs> there's kind of a plan of where they go, you know, for this kind of stuff. But it devastated the Blue River community. And I think they're, what did they say? Between 80 and 100 houses and businesses destroyed at, at least. So tell me about the early stages uh, when you first hit live and went live. Uh, tell me about what that was like and what, what your first reaction and response was to this whole situation. Well, when I saw the first Lane County message that came on my television and our phones about the immediate evacuation order and American Red Cross was at Thurston High School. I got up the next morning and knew I needed to get over there. I knew people would be coming in disoriented. I'm a former soldier. I worked in the Emergency Operations Center at Fort Lewis, Washington. I was one of the three supervisors. We managed all of the West Coast, Japan, Hawaii, Alaska, Korea, all the West Coast, all military forces, all military operations, all deployment. So I knew that there was going to be a big need of personnel there to help serve and participate and organize and and get resources. If people are being evacuated and they're coming down towards us and we knew that Thurston High School was the evacuation point, they were going to need people there on the ground, hands on, uh, to participate. So I got up first thing the next morning when it was right there at 7.30, I guess, 7.45. Right. And we're glued to our phones you know, during this whole thing, checking out any little in, you know, bit of information that would come out. And because you and I recently have become friends on social media, I saw your live feed and, and you just jumped right into it. And so then, yeah, when you showed up to the shelter, uh, there's a lot of people working there, but you're the face that I kept seeing. And so I, I just felt compelled. I'm like, I, I have a connection with, with Mark. I reached out to a couple of different people about covering this. But you and I had already built some rapport. And the couple people that I talked to, they're just so spent, you know, and I, and I appreciate you doing this on short notice. We planned this a couple hours ago, you know, so I just under, I, I understood I wasn't going to push. Uh, and I had an episode kind of planned with Thomas Huda, which we were going to push back because the only thing we could be co covering right now is the fires, you know, so I wasn't going to do an episode, but fortunately we decided that we could come back to, to our house for now. We've got everything kind of set. We're, you and I are basically neighbors, so we're kind of on the edge of the level one evacuation. We're not in it, you know, so we're close. We had left and packed up because I had to work all week. I was like, I don't want to be at work and then get that call. And evacuations were travel were happening so fast. I mean, we're this is I've never been in a situation that I can remember that I've been this close to the evacuations. I've heard of them happening in the surrounding areas. But it, for it to hit Thurston would be catastrophic. Now, it's already ca catastrophic. I don't want to downplay that. But when the Blue River in the mountain and the wood areas, this is kind of normal. I mean, more normal. But for it to get to houses is not. Uh, personal note, my stepsons, their dad lives in Blue River. So they both attended middle, uh, McKinsey High School. And the, the first night, 
we lost power because of the wind and we were talking to him and he was kind of helping other people evacuate and get out. And he's like, I'll be fine. I'll be fine. And then it, it was like, Oh, I'm not fine. The flames are 30 yards from the house. He got out of Dodge. We thought I, I went to sleep that night thinking he had lost his house. And by the grace of God, he, he didn't lose his house. So we found out that he's going to be okay. He's in a, the Red Cross has helped him by getting him and his wife into a hotel for a couple of weeks. And so they're, they're doing good. And that was really great news. Some of the, the people that we're really associated with that are really good friends with, I have been in the picture for about four or five years and the McKinsey and Blue River community just took me in and embraced me. I come up to the sporting events when my kids were playing basketball, football, track. When you go to a 1A school, you play every sport, you know, you know, so a lot of events. So now what were the first days like at the shelter at Thurston High School? Excuse me. Well, immediately upon arriving at Thurston High School, it was evident there was only just a few people there, a few Red Cross volunteers, and the parking lot was full of evacuees. And Erin Tierney was there with the Chronicle, I noticed. Well, when I came back, she was there. So I checked in right away with uh, the American Red Cross, and I asked, what do you need? And they were overwhelmed, honestly. Um, They responded with, they didn't know. Yeah. They were just trying to get the information from the evacuees. And so more community members had shown up and uh, were asking, how can we help? And I said, well, let's make a plan and let's get to work. Let's let the Red Cross do what the Red Cross can do. And let's talk to these evacuees and help them uh, find places to stay. And it's going to be up to us to get the rest of this work done. Right. And so immediately I uh, contacted and went on Facebook Live, which you saw right away. We need volunteers. Yeah. We need resources. We need to uh, get people here because there was a lot of evacuees. They needed food. They needed water. All they had was uh, the clothes they had on their back. Uh, and I, you heard me say, my, my family is going to do something. Well, my wife was watching the video, too. And she said, okay, I'm making stuff for breakfast tacos. Go get me some tortillas from the store. So she made six dozen breakfast tacos. And I ran home to pick them up and came back. And I wanted to hand them out, hear people's stories, talk with them, you know, pray with them, spend time with them. And the stories, they were horrific. Yeah. yeah they were horrific. Imagine. Now, there's been... I mean, there's so much misinformation, so I don't want to add any to that. We're going to talk about that in a little bit, but there has been a few fatal or casualties that we've, that we're aware of, right? There's been a few losses of life. We don't know the numbers and, but the, the destruction has been catastrophic. I was actually up in Blue River the Friday before camping and it was so populated that we could only get one night because we like to stay at the paid places because we're, we're, we're city kids, but, but, uh, so, I mean, I know how, how populated I've talked to a lot of people that were camping, that were, that were doing long trips and, and people have, are, like I said before, they're kind of used to fire a little bit. So if it's off in the distance, you're like, oh, it's not going to travel that fast. I mean, it was the wind that really changed things. And so a lot of people were told to evacuate and they didn't initially because mm-hmm. they're like, no, no. But it was pretty clear pretty early on that this is different, you know, that this is different. So... What was a big shift in the shelters? Because the shelters now have gotten just bombarded. The shelter has gotten bombarded with donations, uh, you know, and so now they're kind of overran. That's one of the things that I saw that you were saying is now, and we're going to get to the relocation to Springfield High, but now what they need volunteers for is to help distribute and to separate and organize the stuff. Is that correct? Yes. So initially, People were, I didn't realize the amount of people that were, saw those videos until they started showing up saying, I saw your video. And they would have just vehicles were just started pouring into the parking lot. Budweiser showed up with water and Gatorade and soda and uh, food trucks showed up, said, we saw your video. Walmart showed up, said, we saw your video. Dentist office showed up, we saw your video. We're all here to drop supplies off. So... The good thing about those videos is that people saw and immediately responded, but volunteers weren't getting there fast enough. Right. So it was a struggle. First, it was just me and one other person the first two to three hours trying to unload all the vehicles by ourselves sure. and get everything set up. And so, yeah, so there was some disorganization because there was no manpower. Right. And then as the day went on, volunteers started showing up. But the degree of 
donations was uh, it was unbelievable in a beautiful way. Sure. We just didn't have the manpower to, to receive it fully until towards the evening and more volunteers came in in that first day. So things were beginning to take shape and beginning to st uh, take form. So as things progressed with the evacuations, one of the reasons that we left is that the evacuations, as as the fire traveled, because everybody pictures it as coming in down 126 and it doesn't work that way. It's traveling in the woods that are on the other side of the river. So it's heading out towards Marcola Mohawk area. And so uh, the evacuations kind of extended and Thurston Road, the evacuation, the way that it was worded, it's Walterville to Thurston Road and Thurston Road's misleading because it goes and it changes course. Mm -hmm. It doesn't go parallel to 126. It changes course and then meets 126, you know? So mm -hmm. for, for me, even I was thinking, isn't Thurston Road 58th, but it's not, I mean, you know, so I'm, I'm new to the area to be honest, but uh, a lot of people are going to clown on me for saying that, but it's true. I don't, I don't know this area that well. So the, the evacuations were kind of, a lot of people were like, what does that mean? Where is that at? And so for us, we were just like, let's get out before there's craziness. Now, like with traffic and whatnot. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, when the relocation happened, because then the evacuation line had been extended to in town to past Thurston High School, basically, uh, that was a very quick decision for them to relocate to Springfield. And what was that process like having to relocate now all the donations? Well, the, first of all, when it came, the information came on that their level one to Bob Straw, that was Thurston High School. Yeah. So we were in the midst of receiving amazing amounts of, of uh, donations. We had all the food trucks there. The parking lot was full. We still had evacuees now that were already coming in from Walterville, from Thurston, that were leaving their homes, that were trying to get some food, trying to get supplies. And then we were, no then we were notified, we have to start evacuating right now. Wow. So we're talking about all volunteers working together, pulling together, no formalized transportation, no transportation on hand except our individual vehicles. Wow. No formalized communication system, no financial support, no governmental leadership as far as the city or the county. There was no CERT teams there. There was no emergency operation uh, personnel there. I'm not blaming them. I'm just trying to paint. No, the I understand. Picture. Yeah. I'm trying to paint the picture. You just had a bunch of community volunteers pulling together to try to get everything loaded up and get it over to Silky Field. Wow. And then so in the midst of the population evacuating, you have trying to get all these volunteers to get all this equipment, clothes, food, all of the supplies over and set up to Silky because all the, ev all the evacuation personnel or the evacuees were then heading over there. And that was the new rally point for Springfield. Right. So we knew that there was a great population going over there. So trying to get everything loaded over there, set up uh, in an organized, deliberate manner so we, you could access it immediately. And then trying to get, so you can meet the needs of the people. It was a lot of hard work. Sure. Now at this point, roughly, how many evacuees were there at the shelter when it was being relocated? Uh, well, when we were at Thurston High School, it's hard to tell because there was there was just so many people there at that point. Right. New people were coming in from Walterville and even Thurston that were now leaving. And so there I would say probably 50, 60 families. Well, families. So then multiple, you know, wow. Mm -hmm. Wow. So now with the Springfield shelter, there's something you had posted on, on Facebook that I wanted to address that's difficult. That's a difficult thing. There's been some critiques and some criticisms from some armchair quarterbacks about uh, an issue that took place. And you would tell it better than I could. So just kind of tell me what has happened. And you, you can tell the story better than I could. Well, this morning I woke up to what well, I woke up to several messages from a Facebook post someone had made in the middle of the night. Several people for, forwarded it to me. They were very angry at the they were very angry at the individual for the critique. Uh, they thought it was unfair. Uh, they thought they were angry because they had been watching all, all the hard work that was being done. And apparently an individual here in Springfield went over there to provide security or something in the middle of the night or help direct traffic. 
And he's, according to this person, there was a lot of stealing going on. There was a lot of uh, people coming in saying they needed help and that they were taking multiple loads uh, and that there was no, I guess for lack of a better word, no real command or control. There was not checking any IDs. Uh, vehicles had California plates and Washington State plates. So let's talk about that a second. First of all, we had already been doing this for a couple of days. Evacuees had rental cars. Some of them had rental cars already. Sure. Or and bought a car in California anyway. Yeah. That had, yeah, that had California and Washington State plates. You get that you get that from wherever you get a vehicle from. Right. We know that we have evacuees from Washington State and California here in the Springfield Eugene area because those people have families here. Sure. So this person was just throwing a lot of stones and throwing a lot of rocks, how disorganized we were. Apparently, there was a couple of other teachers there in the middle of the night saying how disorganized we were. We didn't have any command and control. We were letting people take what they wanted, which isn't true. We have, you know, in the middle of the night, you're going to have less people there. But you and I, if you're working with someone, how do you know who an evacuee is? If they tell you the evacuee, we're not going to sit there and say, well, let me see your ID. Let me see what was your address. Let me make sure your house was in the line of fire. Let me make sure that wherever you lived, you were in the evacuation zone. We were just trying to help everybody that came. Right. And this person made such a, a negative post about fraud and in stealing and embezzlement and all these other significant words, and it cost a, cast a very negative shadow over all the work that had been done, over all the people that had been doing the hard work. And uh, a lot of people were very upset about that. I just don't know what's the gain there. I mean, I get the optics if what they saw they felt like they saw, you know, and I'm sure they're exaggerating every detail, you know, if there's anything there. But the reality, like you said, I mean, how are you going to manage something like this when there's no chance for no time for training, no command, you know, control, like you said, there's no, I mean, you're trying not to step on each other's toes. So you obviously, we, it's funny, last episode, we talked about leadership. You've obviously taken on a leadership role in this, but it's also not your thing you know you're just doing your part you're just a citizen volunteer just like anybody else so but man i mean that that was pretty nerve-wracking to read and it's just the common thread that we see now we're gonna get again to misinformation i want to get to that in a little bit uh actually let's talk about that now you know there's so much misinformation about things about how fires are being started uh there is evidence and police i guess for me what it takes is the local news when they report something because they have regardless of what someone says about fake news the news has not only an ethics they have a legal standard that they have to live by where i'm not a journalist doing this podcast i am not so if i say something and it's not, it's not accurate call me out on it that's fine but i am not a journalist i'm just a human being having a, having a conversation but the the news they have a, a legal standard they have to go by to where they won't report something unless there's evidence you know and we're not talking about anonymous sources that's a whole different issue but the thing is, is that there has been stories that have, have been talked about and also arrests made by people starting fires. So that's there. But the FBI has had to be called in on this because of claims that it's Antifa or to be fair, even far right extremists. There's no evidence to support that there's an organized ring of fire, you know, that that's being said. I mean, what do we do to squash this misinformation in a time of distress like this? Well, let's talk about that. Uh, when I was with Erin Tierney at the, from the Chronicle, and we were, she was recording all these conversations, firsthand accounts, eyewitness accounts, and the stories, they were horrific. The, the, the comments coming from those that fled were very detailed about our neighbors didn't make it out. There was only a few of us that did. We had to go the back roads, and one of the vehicles had toe straps and saws. We were able to cut our way, cut the tree through, out of, cut the tree and get it out of the way so we can make it out or we would have died too. Talking about the campers that you mentioned, seeing campers trying to run on foot from the fire because their car, the cars were blowing up. Very detailed, very specific eyewitness accounts for that were there. So when people were asking me, and I, and I said several times in my video, if what these witnesses accounts are, if they're true, it's going to be catastrophic. 
it's going to be much worse than anyone anticipated. We had several people there telling us in detail about how Blue River was gone. No one wanted to believe it, but the people that escaped it said it's gone. Right. Many people from Vida that had come in said this area of Vida is gone. This area isn't, but this area is. And then some of the other ones contradicted that, but people wanted to know what was happening and no one knew. Sure. So what you're saying is essentially like to give the news a little bit of credit is that they literally reported that eyewitnesses had said this and then they didn't have time in 20 minutes sometimes to put out a statement. They they didn't have time to do the due diligence to make sure that that was true. I mean, I know that the bridge is a big one and Ike's pizza that everybody's talked about. They said, Oh, the bridge is gone. You know, the, the iconic bridge and then Ike's pizza and Dakota's and all these different, you know, iconic businesses. Some of them are gone. I've I, holiday. Uh, cr- what is it? Treasures, cr- Christmas treasures that is gone, you know, and that's been the staple and there's a lot of stuff that's gone, but I don't, I don't know. I mean, I don't know what people expect that they, they expect to know it immediately. Well, you have to remember, I, I had posted on Facebook when people are asking, people's adrenal gland are pumping, they're escaping, they're running for their lives. There's what is, and then there's what they think they see with, with their eyes. Several of the people that have fled Vida had said specifically, Vida store burned down, the bridge, everything in Lieberg is on fire, Ike's is gone. People were saying that, that we're running from the fire. Right. Well, like yeah. I said about my boys, is my, my stepson's dad, mm-hmm. that he was like, it's gone. It's a total, because he expected, how could it not be? And he was lucky, you know what I mean? Like fortunate, I should say. And, but, but how could you know? But yeah, I mean, eyewitnesses have always been a, a difficult thing when it comes to exactly what happened, because there's what you see or what you think you see and what actually happened. But now the misinformation as far as what's starting the fires, this is something that has been rampant because people just want something to blame, you know? And I think that that has a lot to do with that negative, negative review. I mean, we've become a one star to five star world, you know, it's like Applebee's, you know, we're going to give them a one star because my chicken wings were cold, you know, kind of thing. And that's what that review was or that, that complaint was, it was a bad review. And those are rampant on the internet. But when it, you know, I don't know, the misinformation with, if, about what's starting the fires, people want something to blame. Because when something this horrific is happening, they want something to be able to point their finger at. And since we live in such a divided nation, mm-hmm. it's easy for people to be like, I know who I can blame. The same culprit for everything, you know, and it's just disgusting. I mean, the Antifa argument, and I'll get to why it's not far right people either. Because I've said it many, many, many times that the right, the idea that the right doesn't care about the climate and the environment is absolutely ridiculous because hunters and campers and woodsy outdoor people love the earth, love the environment, love the, you know what I mean? The, all the critters in it. So that's just ridiculous. But as far as Antifa, Antifa would be, there's just a bunch of hippie kids. Like there's no way that they would be wanting to start the fires. Now I know on the website, or this is a rumor that the Antifa website, which I don't even know what the hell that means. Like it's not an organized organization that they said the rural community, we're coming for you. And I'm pretty sure that that is more like as they age progress, you know, as the ages progress, they're talking about the voting booths, but still, still, ah, I just don't even know what to do. I don't know what to do about the misinformation. And I've talked to, I work in a barber shop, So all week I had heard unfounded claims about, Oh, this whole thing is nonsense. I'm like, how is a fire a hoax? You know, that's how it, and how it was started. How is that a hoax? Now, there absolutely is people starting fires. That's been proven. And we've seen way too many cases. And I don't know what compels somebody to do something like that. But I don't care what their affiliation is politically. They're a scumbag. Mm -hmm. If they do that, they're a murderer, you know, an attempted murderer. So I don't know what to do about it, about, you know, to squash that. Well, I'll tell you at the Silky Field, there are many organizations there. And so Patriot Rescue is there. The three percenters are there. We the people are there. Black Lives Matter are there. Black Unity is there. All these different groups bringing goods, finances, working together and helping. 
So whoever is starting the fire, I can, in my humble opinion, they don't belong to any of those groups. They're just people with their own mindset, their own issues, and causing that those kind of problems for, for whatever reason. One of the people that I've had on my podcast, Trey Stewart of Boop Troop, Eugene, he's been extremely active in using his platform, which is gigantic. It's one of the biggest platforms in the county, if if not the biggest, you know, that, that every time he hits live, there's hundreds of people involved, which is big, you know? And he's raised so much money and gone and bought toys for the kids that have been evacuated, dog food, you know, pet food, water. I'm sure that you guys have seen each other's work and seen and come together. And, and so I want to make sure that people understand he gets a lot of flack, gets death threats, all that stuff, you know, and then the Patriots, like you're talking about, those people are coming together. They're like, let's leave it to the side because I've seen on his threads before that one night in Thurston, they were kind of, kind of coming together and people were listening to each other. I think it needs to be said what today is. We're recording this episode. I'm probably going to release it later, but it's 9-11, you know, and it's the 19-year anniversary of 9-11. I don't know if anniversary is the right word, but what happened after 9-11? We saw the country come together. We saw people working together. We saw people forgetting their differences. Everybody was an American after that day. And these tragedies are tragic, are tragic you know, and horrific. But my hope is that we're going to see some of that. We're going to see people coming together. Unfortunately, when the enemy is us, when the enemy is our own people, it makes it a lot more difficult. Because how do we band together when we can't look each other in the eye and know if we have each other's best interests at heart? Mm -hmm. So I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do to put up our white flags, you know, like of, of surrender, not surrender, but like taking the gloves off, whatever the expression is, you know, I don't know. Well, I think this this opportunity that has we've been given in this tragic fire, and it is an opportunity, is to just discover who we really are as people, and who we really are as the human race, as a, as a humanity, and in spite of those that come to steal, in spite in spite of those that come to criticize, in spite of those that come to cause havoc, the majority of those that are there are there to do good and to help and to serve and to insert themselves into something very horrible and to make a difference. And having all those different di diametrically opposed groups at Silky Field, at Thurston High School, no one in either of those scenarios, <clears throat> in those settings, no one was talking about the president, no one was talking about a Republican, no one was talking about a Democrat, no one was talking about all these issues that have been driving the world crazy so to speak right none of that mattered none of that even came into question people came in wearing black lives matter flying trump flags all these different things and everyone was working together right unloading loading helping serving Th this is what this has shown us that we are still those people and can still be that nation right so now what can be done what can we do uh you know do you know the best place for people to donate money over the internet? Because one of the things that's forgotten in this is COVID, is that for some people, like myself, I'm very careful about where I go where there's crowds, mm -hmm. you know? And so is there, a good, is there a good spot for people to donate money online? Right, so there's a couple of places, United Way as well as the American Red Cross. You know, yeah. re remember when we be initiated this volunteer service project, so to speak, there was no formalized organization. We don't have. We weren't a nonprofit. Many people were coming and giving envelopes of cash, and the Red Cross was like, "We can't take that. We're not authorized to take that." And everyone insisted on leaving it. So that we were told, "You can take the money. Uh, go buy supplies directly with the money, or you can deposit it into your account and then donate it to." Uh, the American Red Cross. Because there has to be, there's legal, yeah. Right, so uh, we had, even last night when I left, we had an envelope full of cash and gift cards and all of those things. We're, we're City of Destiny Church here in Springfield as Metronet Ministries, and then we're going to start running all those donations through them wow. so that there's an accounting of the money sure. so that everything can be properly not only accounted for but provided providing needs for uh, the community. So that was just one other area of 
fallout, so to speak, from just having a bunch of volunteers coming together. Now, so the, you go ahead. So now people can donate to the American Red Cross or locally at the United Way where they have funds set up. So the when you say locally at the United Way, the one issue that I've heard, if you donate money to the Red Cross, is it going to local people? Well, well they're, they're supposed to have a um, segment on their website that is specifically for this geographical area and for the fire. Okay, good. So people look out for that because there's ways, I mean, right now there's fires across the, the West Coast. I mean, it's California's getting devastated. I know that when you watch the news, the national news, that's all they talk about is California, which is whatever. This is, this is a time that we need to focus on Oregon. We're in Oregon in a crisis. We're going to worry about that crisis. You know? If you give it to the United Way, for sure. There are, this is Arlene County United Way. I was on the board of directors for the United Way years ago, as well as I was on the board of directors for the American Red Cross as wow. well. Yeah. So, so I know how both of those organizations theoretically are supposed to work. And our current United Way, the Lane, United Way of Lane County, has one of the highest ratings in the nation for fiscal responsibility. So United Way is a good one. Now, yeah. the reason, because there's a lot of surplus of stuff, but what is what is it as far as goods that still needs to be donated? Well, right now they're not taking any donations for evacuees because they have just about everything covered. So they're now they're asking for now. Let me just say this: that United Way is now taking over. Okay, good. Okay? And they need to because yes. they have the infrastructure, they have the finances, they have the communication infrastructure, they have the uh, community support for a, a full a conglomerate to come together. To this is going to go on for months, not sure. not four or five more days. This is going to go on for months. Right, and accountability. Yes, okay. accountability. It's like that, that criticism. We're not going to ignore it completely. You're taking it to heart. I'm sure it hurt to hear it, but you're like, look, I'm doing the best I can, you know, with what I've got. And so I don't want it. I don't want it. I'm sure that hurt to hear, but I want you to know that what you've done is not going unnoticed and the leadership has been incredible. So that it hurt for me to read it because I'm like, God, that stings. But I'm glad to hear that there's, there's a, a, a structure in place now, you know, and, and that's good. Now, volunteers, I read uh, and have heard that volunteers now have to sign up to help. Like if you're going to go down to volunteer because of probably because of COVID and because there's a structure in place, we need to make sure that there's a time and then also probably to cover every time that's needed. Is that that's correct. That's correct. So one of the big issues of registering ahead of time is for the gov governmental requirement of, <clears throat> of tracking because of COVID, is that, that the right word? Contact or, tracing. Contact, co contact tracing, right? right? So that's that's that component is really, really very important. And when they meet, they set that up immediately at Sil Silky Phil for the contact tracing, right. right? So it's not, they're not asking people to sign in because they're trying to be difficult. They're trying to make sure that we know who's here, when they're here, if someone gets sick, if there's an outbreak, we can trace it back to this place at this time. What kind of precautions are being taken, uh, like as far as masks in the shelters? Now, is if someone's indoors and they're in communal areas, are they? Is there a lot of masks being worn? Uh, there's mask. There's uh, hand sanitizer. All the things that they're required not only to provide but to do, it's being done every day on site by everybody multiple times. And then they're providing the same kind of service to all the evacuees. Right. Completely changing gears, but something that I am curious about, the pets. You know, because I know early on there was a lot of people that brought their animals. What's going on with that? And how was the relocation with that from the – that was must have been just difficult to relocate from Thurston to Springfield with all the animals. Yeah, so Lane County Fairgrounds has been opened up for all the pets, for all the animals. So there's just dozens of them out there. And m the feed has been coming in. Medical supplies have been coming in. A lot of these animals have wounds. So the medical supplies have come in to care for the animals. The food is coming in, litter box, litter, dog food, carriers, lots of different things for the larger animals have also already been provided. Right. Yeah, I've heard, I've seen posts Oh, a post that a bunch of my friends shared. I need to 
uh, relocate 40 horses. Mm-hmm. And that was one group. And it's just uh, anybody who has 40 horses, they must really love their wife. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's all I can say because they can't talk me into that. No, yeah. but I don't know. I'm an animal lover though. So that when, when you were saying that, that we needed people to come like help with the animals. So, so the relocation, was that difficult? I mean, they're all accounted for right now and everything is going okay. Well, for those that could save their animals. Yeah. Many people didn't, couldn't save their animals. Right. They lost their, their horses, their cows, their goats, oh brought everything. Oh my gosh. And now I know you're not a firefighter, but uh, how, how? I did you? fight wildfires. In, uh, oh, several. did you? In, in wildland, yeah. So mm-hmm. now, what does the situation look like moving forward? I mean, do are we in Thurston? Are we in the middle of Springfield? Are we at risk? Uh, I would say that we are not at risk. There's a skirmish line at 69th. They have plans in place now on how to, if it if it came to that, if fire reached 71st, 72nd, we're done. There's wow. nothing to stop it. Wow. There's, you know, the, the, it would be catastrophic because it would ignite so quickly. Uh, Springfield itself would be would be at least up to Bob Straub at a minimum would be gone. And I want it to be said, obviously the people in Vida and the people in Walterville are everybody's as valuable as the, as the next person, you know, and, and my heart goes out. I just want to know, you know, because I think a lot of people want to know, like, where's the line where you can be considered safer? Nobody's completely safe in this situation, but, uh, and I mean, shout out to the blue river community 10,000 times over, you know, because that is such an amazing community that my heart breaks. I was happy to hear that the high school McKinsey high school made it. Because my kids, though they're 18 and 19, so they don't, right now they're like, eh, you know, you know, but I know, I know deep down how much they care about the community, not the school is what I'm saying. Cause obviously they care about the community. They, they've, they show that every day, you know, that's an amazing community out there. They call them, they call one a guy, not everyone, but I talked to a guy one time. I thought this was funny. He said, we call ourselves dreadnecks. <laughs> and it's like, what's that? And he's like, we're, we're hippies with guns. <laughs> no, but that's what there's so many cool people and you'd go to those talking about di- the divisions and people coming together. I'd go to these sporting events and there'd be a dude wearing hemp clothes with dreadlocks sitting next to a dude with flannel and maybe even a red hat, you know, and they were buddies. And it was I'd love that community. And that's a microcosm of Oregon that we need to see in the whole country. I mean, we've got our issues in this state, but at the end of the day, we're all Oregonians, and I think we all love this state. You know, maybe not as much as people love Texas, but still, that's a different. Issue. <laughs> yeah, I grew up in Texas, brother. That's a whole different story. In Doug. Texas, I, I heard this thing recently that said, "I wish people in Texas, and I wish people in America loved America as much as people in Texas love Texas." Yes, I thought that's pretty great. Mm-hmm. Well, Mark Molina, two times, two episodes in a row, ninety-six and ninety-seven for me. I had to have you back on. I had to have you back on because what you're doing is incredible. The work you're doing is incredible. I think you're an inspiring individual. I've been telling you off air that I'm going to force you to run for mayor. (laughs) So that day will come. I don't care what you say. I would just like to acknowledge all the volunteers. Yeah. All those that stepped up. All that it became all that it grew into with the amount of commitment and devotion, the sacrifices, obviously from all those that donated, but all those that are on the ground working hard, trying to get everything into place, working at night, early in the morning, working during the day, uh, 10 hours, 12 hours, whatever they can give. And they're still there and they're still there as we're on this show. And they're gonna be there all night and I just want to acknowledge all the volunteers and thank them for responding to those early calls. And then as it grew into what it is now, all those that stepped up into new and different kind of leadership roles and took on that responsibility that allowed uh, uh, some of us to become more fluid. I, my, now my role is changing. Now I'm. they've asked me to move more into a pastoral care role. So I'm going to Great. start that tomorrow. And, you know, I, I felt what what I needed to do was done 
and now the United Way is there and they're going to start managing managing it differently and we need to let them do that that's yeah, yeah. yeah. We need to let those that have that expertise do those things that have to be done. And I, I want to encourage you, Patty Rose, to you know go out there, hear people's stories with your media role. People look to you. People trust you. you know, you're a leader. People listen to what you have to say, and you can make a significant difference, too. And it, I was really impressed to get to Silky Field and to see all of those other warring groups, for lack of a better description, yeah. Yeah. all be working side by side. And no one was talking about anything except how do we help this next group of evacuees that just walked on to right. Silky Field. Yeah, I thought about doing an uh, audio only. You know, I thought about doing an audio only little two minute clips for people to share their stories, you know, and then compile it into an episode. I'm going to see what I can do this weekend. That's kind of why I wanted, this is Friday night. That's kind of why I wanted to jump on it tonight. And I'm so grateful that you agreed to do this today mm -hmm. because that way I have the weekend that I can go and do some help as well and volunteer. So now that leads to a really important question. We talked about the fact that people need to sign up to volunteer, but where do they do that? Uh, if you go online to the United Way, they have a, a website uh, to do that at. Okay, that's really important. So I'll just put the link in the show notes to the United Way. Mm -hmm. And uh, is I'll find I'll dig and see if there's a specific link. But if there's not, then you guys will have to kind of navigate that yourselves when you yeah. listen. Yeah, th there is a specific link, but they should be able to access it from the United Way. Right. And so for someone like you, if you're going to go listen to stories and stuff, you just show up and do your thing. Yeah, we'll see. I mean, I'd like to share it. I'd like to just be a human being as well. It doesn't necessarily need to be an episode. So some of it might just be, I come back and share my experience mm -hmm. of what I hear, but I'd like to also give people a chance to have a platform to be heard, you know, so. Yeah, I, I want to say something to you. You know, my daughter, <clears throat> she's eight, my youngest daughter, I have three older children. But she asked me why I was going down there. And this is important for all of us. We both have a lot of people that listen to, to our what we the kind of work that we're doing and i said you know i want you to remember when you get older that when the fires came your daddy didn't run and when the trouble came your family didn't run and we stepped into the hard work that needed to get done to serve our community i said i want you to remember that i want you to remember that you can make that kind of a difference in the world in which you live we have that opportunity now, you and I and the rest of this community. Not everyone's going to heed that call, and not everyone is even remotely interested in that kind of response. No. You and I sure. have that responsibility. I do think it's important to say that the people that want to leave, that want to evacuate, it does help the, the situation by getting out of Dodge. Because So that's not what you're getting at, and I get that. But, but because when they tell you level one, if you want to duck out then, that's smart because for some people, it's like you don't want to have traffic jams. You want people to be able to get out of town. And we're dealing with numbers. I mean, some of the numbers, 500,000 people are displaced from their home in Oregon, 18,000 people in Lane County mm -hmm. that, are, that are under evacuation are already displaced from their home, under evacuation notice as, as low as level one, which means that, hey, be, be alert. And that's where, when I talked about getting into the center of town, we're talking tens of thousands at that point. So for some people to get out of town is a, is a really important thing. But yes, there's to be leaders, you got to step up and not run from it, you know, if you'd like to help. So this weekend, I think we're going to have a lot of people that are going to be doing that, that are going to be stepping up. So go to the United Way's website and find out how you can sign up to volunteer they're good on donations. I do think financial donations are super beneficial because what that does is it allows the evacuees to be covered as far as housing, temporary housing, hotels, and that kind of thing. And then uh, pharmacy needs. Right. And that's something that, you know, they're going to have to work. It's going to be difficult. So, well, Mark Molina, thank you again for doing this. Maybe next time we'll wait more than one episode to have you on, but we're definitely going to have you back on in the future. I'd like to do your show as well. Uh, I'm going to end this with a song. I chose this really fast, but the song is about trying to help take away someone's pain. And in this situation, we wish we, if we, we just want to do anything we can to help take away some of your pain. And so the song is called take away Mark Molina. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Every single 
Try to take away You try to take, try to take 